Good afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm really pleased that you are here and able to join us for a very important conversation. Um, as you know, the water crisis in Flint is ongoing, and we're particularly delighted to have members of the community here to share perspectives as well as talking about policy options. Well, in a moment, I will introduce our moderator, Dr. Don Vereen, and he will have the honor of more formally introducing each of our distinguished panel. But for now, I would simply like to offer a very warm welcome from the Ford School to Mr. Cole, Mrs. Deloney, Ms. Sharif, and Dr. Key. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Well, today's program would not have been possible without generous support from the Gilbert Oman and Martha Darling Health Policy Fund, and so we're very grateful to them as well. I'd also like to remember a very special Ford School alumna and friend, Eunice Burns, who passed away on Friday. Throughout her life, she was a true champion for good water policy and education, and I know that if at all possible, she would have been here with us today. And so it does seem like a fitting tribute um, this Monday to be hosting this very special panel. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Donald Vereen. Don is an accomplished physician with a background in public health and many years of policy experience working for the White House and NIH before coming to the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He's worked on a wide range of policy issues, including substance abuse treatment and prevention, doping in sports, and violence as a public health issue. And throughout, he has been a champion for using data to make decisions and to inform policy, and also for direct engagement with community partners. He's also my husband and my better half for <laughs> um, 27 wonderful years. And so it, oh. <laughs> so that means that I know firsthand not only about his substantive knowledge of the situation in Flint, but also his commitment, his engagement, and his passion with what's going on there. And so it really does seem fitting to have him here as our moderator, and we're delighted um, to welcome him back to the Ford School in that capacity. I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Paula Lance, who will help facilitate the audience questions today. Paula is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Ford School, and she has led the efforts on our behalf as part of organizing today's panel, really taking special care to ensure that we are able to hear perspectives from the community, which is so often not featured in discussions like this. So Paula, thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts. And you have, uh, you beat me to it because my next line was going to be, please join me in a welcome to all of our participants, and I think we've already done that. <laughs> so before we begin, just a word about the format. Um, Don Vereen will first briefly introduce our panel, um, and he'll help to frame the discussion that we'll have today. Next, our panelists will each offer introductory remarks, and then Don will moderate a discussion before we open things up for questions from the audience. So I'd like to remind you that you should have received cards when you came in. Please write your questions on those cards. And about 4.40 or so, Ford School staff will start walking um, up and down the aisles to collect your cards. If you're watching us online, please use um, Twitter to send your questions to us and use the hashtag policy talks. And so with no further ado, I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Don Vereen to the podium. Good afternoon. It really is a, a pleasure uh, to be here uh, right now. And um, before we get started, I too want to give a special, special thanks to the Ford School uh, for having the idea to, to, to do this, uh, the dean in particular, and Paula Lance and uh, Cliff Martin for your help in, in organizing this. This is a, a bit unusual. But there is a lot of really good data sitting here um, and appreciate the forum that you've organized uh, for, for this to happen. I'm going to make a statement and then I'm going to introduce the members of the panel. 
They're a part, the reason I'm giving the statement first and not introducing them first is because there is a big, broad issue that they've all been working on that is more important than them as, as individuals. And you'll see uh, from their titles how they fit into this uh, topic and what perspectives they can bring directly uh, to you. And hopefully you will engage in a conversation with them and be uh, more learned about uh, the issues uh, before us um, as this uh, uh, activity proceeds. The Flint water crisis is a perfect storm of events and conditions that culminated in the prolonged um, uh, uh, contamination of water in the city of Flint. These conditions and events included the biology of toxic river water running through pipes inadequately prepared for that water, a community, a chronically stressed and challenged community whose observations, reports, and complaints about the quality of the drinking water went unheeded or at best got anemic responses by all levels of government, local, county, state, regional, and yes, federal. For more than two years before the crisis, the community was up in arms about the quality of the water. The city of Flint is under the, was under the control of an emergency manager, an important backdrop uh, that will be discussed. The state and the entire country is facing a backlog of infrastructure improvements. And Flint right now is a focal point of that challenge uh, uh, for this country, the state, and the city. News reports have contained specifics like, what happened in Flint? Uh, when did it happen? Who made it happen? Uh, when did responsible officials know? What did they know and when? Um, what could be ascertained from emails without even the help of WikiLeaks or uh, uh, the Russian uh, government? But reports of and from the victims of this disaster have been sparse. How are the children doing? the children whose developing brains were exposed to high levels of lead for who knows how long. What has been put in place for them? How are the citizens of Flint coping with a life that requires the daily use of a case of bottled water to brush their teeth, bathe, rinse and cook their food, and everything else that goes along with living a normal life? Now there are water filters and the water is apparently okay enough to, to bathe in, to take a shower in. Um, but there are still some things that are, that are unclear, uh, and the, the population is living in a state of unsuredness. Also sparted, uh, uh, sparsely reported are reports on the context of this perfect storm developed within con uh, the conditions that made the, perf uh, the perfect storm possible, and the community, the victims of this man-made uh, disaster. On October 21st, 2016, Governor Rick Snyder appointed a five-member Flint Water Task Force. That task force report, uh, which came out uh, approximately six months ago, begins with the following statement. The Flint water crisis is a story of government failure, intransigence, unpreparedness, delay, inaction, and, an env and environmental injustice. And then it goes on to state that the Flint water crisis is also a story, however, of something that did work. The critical role played by enraged Flint citizens, by individuals both inside and outside of the government who had the expertise and willingness to question and challenge government leadership and by members of the free press. So this panel will uh, in part serve as an update of what has happened in the last six months 
but you'll also uh, 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 be introduced uh, to, to issues that occurred uh, in the background. And um, let me introduce uh, the panel. The first person who will uh, present to you is Chris Kolb, a member of that task force and an author of that report. He is the president of the Michigan Environmental Council. He will be followed by Mrs. E. Hill Deloney. She is the executive director of the Flint Odyssey House Health Awareness Center. She will be followed by Nayira Sharif, she uh, is from the Flint Democracy League and the director of Flint Rising. And last but not least, Dr. Kent Key will speak. He is at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine and formerly of the uh, uh, Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research. So with that introduction, let's have Chris start. <coughs> Um, and again, this will be followed by uh, questions. I get to ask the first one. Um, and then hopefully a dialogue after that. Take it away, Chris. Thank you. And, and thank you all for being here. And, and thank you to the Ford School of Public Policy for, for the invitation to, to speak. Uh, often when I've been speaking about Flint, I get about 35 minutes uh, and then open up for questions. But I'll be a lot shorter uh, today. They asked me really to kind of go over uh, what the task force did, the process, its findings and recommendations, and so I'll try to keep myself to that. Uh, it was almost about a year ago today uh, when I was, uh, received the phone call from the governor's office. Now, I was on my way from Ann Arbor to Detroit to, to meet with a bunch of uh, folks who are going to be working on regional transit issues, and it's actually the BALD initiative that you, you have before us uh, here in southeast Michigan. And my phone rang, and I don't know about you, but when I'm driving, uh, I don't always pick up the phone unless I know who it is and what they might be wanting. Uh, and there's only a couple of people who I really will pick up the phone for, and one of them is my mother. And you know, the reason I do that is I know if I don't take that first phone call, the second one's going to be a lot worse. Uh, but I noticed that the, the, the caller ID told me it was the governor's office, and they don't usually call me you know, just to say, hey, how you doing? What's your day like? Uh, it usually means uh, there's something up, I've done something wrong, or my organization has gotten underneath their skin. So it was a little like, okay, let's see what they want. Uh, and it was that phone call uh, that would change not only my workload and focus for the next five months, uh, but it was also change my entire perspective on environmental protection for myself and for my, my organization as well. Uh, I was asked in that phone call if I would co-chair the governor's Flint Water uh, Advisory Task Force. And I've had people who, who have questioned my willingness to, to participate in it, uh, but I think that if the governor asks you, regardless of who that governor is, to do something that you think will be for the good of the, of the state, there's really only one answer, and that answer uh, is yes. Uh, we worked for five months. Uh, to, to come up with the report. Uh, when we uh, held our press conference in, in March uh, of, last, of this year, uh, I said that I thought the Flint water crisis was a toxic brew, a toxic brew of ignorance, incompetence, and arrogance. The Attorney General has now added criminal uh, to that list as well, and it all could have been avoided. Uh, and should never have happened in the first place. We were a five-member task force, including uh, Dr. Matt Davis, formerly of the Ford School, uh, myself, Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, a pediatrician from Flint, Eric Rothstein, who was a national water industry management consultant, and Ken Sikama was the other co-chair, and, and Ken is a senior policy fellow at Public Sector Consultants and has previously uh, served 20 years in the Michigan legislature, including being the uh, majority leader of the Senate. Uh, we were asked to, to really conduct an independent review of the contamination of the Flint water supply, basically what happened why it occurred, and what could be done to prevent it from ever happening again. We interviewed and talked with over 63 individuals. Uh, we read uh, 
pages, thousands and thousands of emails, public documents. Uh, the interviews that we conducted were all voluntary. Uh, the individuals were not under oath. Uh, we basically had a discussion with them. We would go in, introduce ourselves, tell them what our mission was, and we asked them to tell us what they knew that could help us in, in making our, our report. And for the most part, we got pretty good uh, cooperation from them. So who were these types, who were the people we interviewed? Well, we in interviewed the DEQ employees, Department of Environmental Quality, who had made decisions uh, on Flint and the Flint drinking water, uh, including the, the head of the Department of Environmental Quality. We talked to all the, uh, front, or not all, but, but many of the frontline uh, individuals in Flint who worked at the Flint Water Treatment Plant, uh, the head of the uh, Public Works Department. We interviewed all four emergency managers, uh, individuals in the State Department of Health and Human Services, the County uh, Health Department, Treasury, uh, the EPA. I actually flew to Chicago and interviewed uh, the EPA uh, employees uh, to be someone in the room with them as my other colleagues were on the phone. Uh, and for those of you who know the situation, I actually interviewed Susan Hedman, who was the regional uh, head administrator of Region 5 on her last day in her off physical office, which was a pretty surreal moment uh, to see them boxing, you know, taking boxes out and, and her answering our, our questions. And we also interviewed the, the governor himself. himself. Uh, prior to our re final report, we issued three letters to the governor. We made all of our findings uh, public. The first one in de early December called on um, improving coordination uh, on the ground in Flint. Uh, we had been up in Flint. We saw lots of things happening, but we weren't sure that they were happening in the right order and the right things were being done. Uh, the, the highest priority were being done first. The second letter was the one that I think gave our task force some real uh, credibility and that was done at the end of the year and in that letter we placed the primary accountability and responsibility with the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and we criticized them also for the tone of their communications they would over and over deny and try to discredit anyone who challenged their assertion that the water was safe to drink and in January of of 2016, we did our third letter, and, and that basically said that the government was going to have to uh, have uh, engagement and bring in trusted experts who are outside of state and local government if they ever were going to get the, the public to, uh, uh, you know, accept what they were, they were saying. So our final report uh, came out late March. It had uh, 36 findings, 44 recommendations, it also was a consensus document, meaning that all five of us had to agree uh, with what was in it. We definitely did not want to have a minority uh, report. We didn't want to have some recommendations with, you know, four to one, three to two. We wanted to be all five of us to be able to stand behind this report. Uh, and I can proudly say that, that we did it, and it was really pretty easy. Uh, the final report served three purposes. Uh, one, we wanted to clarify the roles of the parties involved and to assign accountability for what had happened. Second, we wanted to highlight the causes of the government failures uh, that led to this crisis and to make sure that such a, a failure never happened again. And then we also wanted to, to provide recommendations for the ongoing recovery of the Flint community and to use lessons of Flint to better safeguard all Michigan residents. So you heard uh, Dr. Vereen talk about uh, our, our statement where we opened up a report and said that the Flint water crisis is a story of government failure. Intransience, unpreparedness, delay, inaction, environmental injustice. And it occurred when state-appointed emergency managers had replaced local representative decision-making. Uh, Dr. Vereen also talked about what did work. Uh, and even though it took time and they were ignored, it was the citizens of Flint who demonstrated, raised the voices, and made eventually the system respond. Uh, it was outside experts uh, who were willing to stand up to government, who took the arrows and slings of outrageous fortune and stood up and took it and didn't go away. And it was a free, a free press 
who use this investigative reporting skills to, to really shed a light on this. So what were our findings? As I said, we had uh, you know, 36 findings. The number one finding was that the DEQ bared primary responsibility for the water contamination in Flint, that the Department of Health and Su Human Services lack of timely analysis and understanding of its own data prolonged the water crisis. It was the emergency managers, not locally elected officials, who made the decision to switch to the Flint River as Flint's primary water source. An ultimate responsibility for, Michi for Michigan executive branch decisions rest with the governor. And the governor relied too much on wrong information from too few people. The Flint water treatment uh, plant uh, was ill-prepared to assume responsibility for full-time operation of the, of the drinking water process, and that the plant, the treatment technologies, the personnel were not ready to go live when they did, and they never should have been given the green light by the state. Communication, coordination, and cooperation between the Genesee County Health Department, the City of Flint, and the Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services was inadequate to protect Flint residents from public health threats resulting from inadequately treated Flint River water. The D uh, Department of Health and Human Services lacked understanding and analysis of the data that it had. It had all the data it needed, but they did not analyze the data that they had. And EPA failed to properly exercise its authority prior to January of 2016. The EPA's conduct cast doubt on its willingness to aggressively pursue enforcement in the absence of widespread public outrage. EPA surely should have acted sooner. Uh, the Flint water crisis is a clear case of environmental injustice. So our recommendations, and just hit some of the, the, high, the, the top line ones. For the Michigan environmental quality, they need to implement a proactive, comprehensive culture change within their department. They need to focus back on the primary mission of protecting human health and the environment. Department of Health and Human Services must provide for more proactive, transparent analysis and respond to critical public health data. The governor needs to improve reporting and decision making to ensure that critical information is verified and that the governor must provide leadership that's necessary for the long-term implementation of the recommendations in our report. Under the emergency manager law, we believe and made a recommendation that the state must review the statute and to provide, at the very least, uh, expertise for effective uh, local government. We also said that they have to involve or should involve local elected officials in key decision making and or appoint an ombudsman who could handle all sorts of disputes. So there would be some way to, to have input or three, have an appeal process for decisions that are made by emergency managers. In our state right now, those emergency managers are the only ones who have power to make local decisions. The only check on them is that any contract over $50,000 have to be approved by the, the state treasurer. All other decisions are theirs to make and theirs alone. Those checks and balances in our democracy, which make it messy at times, are necessarily needed to make sure that decisions are made in the best interest of the, of the, the citizenry. For the Flint, we said for the city of Flint that our recommendation was they needed to implement a programmatic approach to ensure that clean, safe drinking water for Flint could occur when they switch to getting raw water from the Karagandi Water Authority. They need to make sure that when that, they're ready to do that, they have the right treatment, the right physical plant, and they have the personnel to do it right. EPA, they need to exercise more vigor and act more promptly in addressing compliance violations that endanger public health. For the recovery of Flint, we need to fund and implement model education, public health, and infrastructure renewal programs. On a statewide basis, we need to fund and implement uh, model programs for school and daycare 
lead testing in drinking waters. We need to have a lead service line replacement program in the state, and we need to evaluate on a statewide basis our state's drinking water infrastructure. In environmental justice, we need to highlight the issue of environmental justice and make it a key consideration for the, for in critical to state uh, decision makings. We added a section uh, in the report about issues that were presented by the, the Flint water crisis. And the first one was environmental justice. And we found that Flint was an example of environmental injustice. For environmental justice, there's two, two planks. One, there is a fair and non-discriminatory discriminatory treatment of all people and meaningful public involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income in government decision-making regarding environmental laws, regulations, and policies. In Flint, with the Flint water crisis, there was a failure on both of those uh, principles, and this was a clear example of environmental injustice. We asked the governor to issue an executive order mandating guidance and training on environmental justice across all state uh, agencies, uh, highlighting the Flint water crisis as an example of environmental injustice, and that they should implement the environmental justice uh, plan that is already in place for Michigan. Uh, we also wanted to somehow capture the perspectives of the residents of Flint that we had uh, met. And we looked at several of these uh, communities. One was the health community. Here was a health community who is now faced with tens of thousands of citizens who have been exposed to lead. And how were they to deal with this, with the, with the resources that they had, that this was a community-wide crisis, and they were going to have to deal with it. To parents who are feeling guilt, because they, like many of us, said water's good to drink. They were giving their children water to drink, water that was poisoned with lead. Think about what that must feel like to think you're doing something good when potentially you're harming your child. To the non-English speaking residents of Flint, who when they were going door to door, we had National Guard, we had uniformed officers knocking on the door to distribute bottles of water and filters. They wouldn't open the door. Why would they? You know, if you're potentially undocumented, you're not going to open that door. What were they feeling uh, at that moment? To African-American seniors, who this reminded them of Tuskegee syphilis study and other you know, past uh, events. And to the Flint community leaders, who have to deal with this on a long-term basis, deal with the consequences in a now lack of trust for all governmental units. This is what this community is dealing with, and it's not going to be, you know, solved in a year or two years. This is decades, you know, going forward. And so we knew that there were other investigations coming be behind us. We wanted to make sure that we put forward a, a report that answered the, the what happened, why, what can be done uh, to prevent this happening again. And we wanted to make sure that we provide a straightforward report, one that didn't pile on but didn't pull any punches. And you know, since that report has come out, I think the, the findings and recommendations have really been verified by, by others, including just recently the EPA Inspector General, who, who verified that the EPA had the ability to act sooner and should have. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Right now, we'll hear from uh, Mrs. E. Hill Deloney who will provide a bit of a backdrop for us. Um, there's an elephant in the room when discussing environmental injustice, and she will, she will educate us about that, if we don't know it all, about that already. And she'll touch on a couple of other topics, including the loss of trust by the community um, and its leaders. Mrs. Deloney? Often when I speak, people ask me about the race problem in America. My response is, there's not a race problem in America. There is, however, 
a racism problem in America. And if it disappeared tomorrow, it would still be here. Because racism is in the fabric of this country. And it's going to take people who really believe that we're all connected to work on that. Also, I need to define for you so that we will be on the same page how I am, my definition of racism. Racism is race prejudice plus power. That's why I cannot be a racist. And the majority of you who chose or would not choose to be racist can be one, simply because of your birth. So that'd be a conscious decision not to be a racist. When we talk about what is happening in Flint, racism as it relates to the water crisis in Flint is the elephant in the room. However, it also is the elephant in America. Did Flint receive an emergency manager because it is approximately 60% African American and a high percentage of its people are below the poverty line? All of the cities that received an emergency manager was at least 50% African American. And there were other cities that were not that percentage who never received one, whose everything was the same as Flint, Michigan, but they never received an emergency manager. And Flint made it known we didn't want one, and you hear that from another speaker of what Flint did. Imagine getting a call to tip off by a company that says they're a resiliency and recovery organization that you read and get on an email or hear someone talking about. And when you get to that meeting, an organization has not only called a meeting in a month or two before, they have planned the recovery for the city of Flint without the residents. When we arrived at the meeting, first of all, we didn't realize that the Genesee Health System was the same as the community health center that had been there previously had changed their names. But when we got to the meeting, they had this plan laid out for what we are supposed to do and what we're supposed to do. We don't have time to tell you now, but you can believe we really had a time to change that and flip the script to make sure that didn't happen uh, to us. And one of the things they wanted to tell us then was how to put on filters, how to change the water, going to give us a history on um, the water. People who did not even know the majority of the residents had not included them in the planning, but expected us to follow their rule. Well, there's a long story behind that, but we basically decided we would let them know that that was not going to happen. We're talking about trust. It wasn't too much trust in the first place. But when that happened, I cannot tell you how deeply mistrust almost became a cancer in our community. We don't trust anything they tell us, and it's going to be a long time. Because what you may not know, about a year and a half before the governor decided to believe us, the community had not only been protesting, we had taken a bus down to the Capitol, we had signed petitions, we took 2,600 signatures to the mayor. We had done everything we could do. And the only way it got public attention is because one of our colleagues went to her European American friend and she asked her, would she talk about it? And she became the poster child for a city that the African American, all people, but one person. And you don't think that's racism? Maybe there's a new word for it, but we don't think so. But we all were affected by the water. And the national news, we had to get someone who didn't look like 50%, 60% of the neighbor to speak once. We need to understand that trust is very hard to get in the first place. Very, very hard. But it can dissipate in a matter of seconds. And so what we believe and want to believe that when you tell us something, your word is your bond. As it relates to policies, if you review all the policies in your work, and in the United States, most policies either impeded 
or demeaned African Americans. As it relates to research, research has gotten much better since the 1990s when Kellogg introduced the Community-Based Public Health Initiative, which is a forerunner of our Prevention Research Center and Community-Based Public, community public Health Research. Since that time, if you're going to work in our communities, it has to be community-based particular research because when the idea is presented, the community is there. And we talk through it, and we plan, and we make it so everybody can understand. So research has gotten a lot of it, but there are so many researchers who still to this day do not want to work with community-based organization partners. They want to do research on us. Well, we are saying to them, no research on us without us. Thank you, Mrs. Deloney. So we'll next hear from Nayara Sharif. Nayara um, is uh, the director of Flint Rising. Uh, she has also been very busy addressing groups across the country. I think she's going to be at Yale in a couple of weeks to talk about a number of issues related to uh, environmental justice or, or injustice and a, and a number of other uh, policy issues. And so we'll hear from Nayira Sharif right now. Thank you. So um, how I even got into responding to the Flint water crisis, number one, it was an action of the emergency manager and I was one of the co-founders of what eventually became the Flint Democracy Defense League, which was a grassroots group that formed to oppose um, Flint's emergency manager when Flint went to receivership officially in December of 2011. We were kind of a loose network of folks who were um, collecting signatures for the referendum. And on our election day, when we were electing a mayor, the governor made an announcement that we were going to receivership. And um, we decided that we needed to have kind of a, a response on the ground to what we felt was an example of fascism. So the emergency manager law is a law that was adopted originally in March of 2011. And it posits that if you are a poor community, you can lose your democracy. Not because of a war, like there's been wars like won and, and lost over democracy, but with a stroke of a pen, and we lost it here in Michigan. And the, in, in, in Michigan, a, an emergency manager can come into a school district or a municipality and replace two branches of your local government. So for a municipality, that's your mayor and city council or a county executive and county commissioners, or for a school district, your elected school board and the superintendent. And once the emergency manager comes into that community, their powers, um, they, event, they zero out the salaries of those people. And it really shifts the power and, and control from a, a, an elected body that is autonomous and is accountable to the residents who elect them to being employees of the emergency manager for the most part because the emergency manager um, creates through executive orders um, the responsibilities of those formerly elected bodies and they become accountable to the emergency manager. So the emergency manager has the power to hire and fire employees. They also have the power to sell off public assets without a vote of the people. To, they have the power to renegotiate union contracts or vendor contracts without consent of the union or the vendor. They also have the power to dissolve a municipality and without a vote of the people. So um, once the emergency manager made the decision to move over to the Flint River, um, the people in Flint, like we were not really cool with the Flint River in the first place because of the longstanding um, contamination by General Motors. So people were not really happy with that. And once immediately after the switch, people knew that there was a change. And they went down to their city council they used the tools that they thought were available to them and they weren't heard. And, um, and as, as we move forward, 
Uh, we also discovered that there were um, landowners uh, who owned um, apartment buildings and, um, and trailer parks. They were not paying the water bills and then um, and people who are living in those areas are paying rent and paying lot rent. And the city of Flint, through the emergency manager, uh, crap, what is the word? <laughs> had a brain fart. <laughs> Condemned the property. <laughs> so those people had to leave, had to vacate the property like within 24 hours. And um, about six months after the switch, General Motors sent a letter to the emergency manager and said, hey, this Flint water is rusting our parts. And so the emergency manager was like, hey, we're gonna give you a clean source of water and don't worry about that $400,000 a year that you currently pay. You, you're gonna hook you up with clean water. And the residents was like, well, hey, why can't we get clean water? And the emergency manager said, that clean water is not for you. Like, and that's exactly what happened how that happened, but after, um, the reason why the world knows about the Flint water crisis is not only did we, the grassroots resistance, like really pushed the narratives and got Dr. Mark Edwards and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha to validate our own narratives, and also we had an election and we elected a mayor who ran on a platform that the first thing that she was going to do if she was elected to office is she was going to declare a state of emergency based on the lead contamination. And she won, and she did it within 30 days. And that really like blew the media blackout. Because even though we were, we were, we were out there protesting, we were out there marching, we were doing kind of like the community organizing 101, like it was reported, but it was reported very, like very much on the surface. It was very superficial. And we had um, the ACLU, who was an investigative journalist, but he was the one that was really kind of pushing the narrative. It wasn't mainstream media at all. And it was only until um, the emergency declaration, the mayor did an emergency declaration, she was on Rachel Maddow like that same evening. And that really, that really kind of blew the, the lid off of that. But unfortunately, like once we got all the emergency declarations from the county, and the federal level and the state, we thought finally the state is gonna do their job. They did not do their job. And we really, um, in Flint Rising, which is the organization now I'm the director of, it really started with a canvas because the undocumented community did not know that there was a crisis until two weeks after the federal emergency declaration. They discovered it when um, their families called from their countries of origin and told them to not drink the water and when we went to the state's website, there, all the materials were only in English. So we have an uh, undocumented Spanish-speaking community that lives within the city limits. We also have Yemeni and Syrian refugees who live in Flint, in addition to international students who attend our colleges and universities. And um, we had a nonprofit group down in Detroit translate materials into Spanish. And we did a statewide call asking people who spoke Spanish to come to Flint and go door to door to um, let people know to not drink the water and to not boil the water because many people were boiling the water and they thought that that, that made the water safer. And it really doesn't. Lead is, um, like lead is a heavy metal, does not evaporate, actually concentrates if you are boiling the water. And then also with the total trihalomethanes with, if you're, or Legionnaires, um, you can breathe it in through the steam. So we, we had to really tell people to not boil the water. Then also um, with the National Guard distributing water, all of, people all across the country, including celebrities, were sending truckloads of water, semi-trucks loads full of water. And the state um, had mandated that the National Guard had, uh, residents who were going to get water had to show a photo ID or they would not get the water. So I went up there, recorded that, posted on Twitter, within eight hours it went viral and they had to change that policy. But as we moved forward, it was, it was kind of like we saw a messed up policy and then we had to respond. And so it was kind of like this back and forth and we felt like we really need to have a coordinated response, one, to build power on the ground because we had a lot of people who were enraged, which they are rightfully so because their government poisoned them. 
Um, we did not get a, a disaster declaration because under the federal policy, the Stafford Act, uh, we were ineligible for that because this was caused by man. And if those of you who are um, understand intimate partner violence, this really feels like a domestic, like a violent relationship because um, the state is is responsible for poisoning us, and now the state is in charge of our recovery. So we felt that that was highly problematic. And then also, as Mrs. Deloney kind of mentioned, we had paternalistic decision making still ongoing and with many of these agencies, one, who, um, who already had a fractured relationship with the community. And some of those agencies were responsible and, and collaborators in a cover up um, and, and suppressing the knowledge that our water was not safe to drink. So, um, so we eventually created Flint Rising, which is a coalition of grassroots individuals and community organizations that formed to respond to the water crisis. And we also have kind of a broader uh, coordinating table made up of labor and progressive allies. And we really like elevated um, some demands that were already like in, embedded in the community. And, and those three things are one, we don't pay for poison. We're still paying a water bill for this toxic water, and we've been paying for this water since April 2014. And we pay one of the highest bills in the country, and we have 42% of our population that lives below the poverty line. So that's in just right there. Um, and then two, our, our families deserve to be healthy. We need like long-term medical care. Right now, even with this Medicaid expansion, the undocumented community is ineligible because they are undocumented. And you, even if you are documented, you have to be in the country at least five years to be eligible for Medicaid under the current um, statute. And then three, they need to fix what they broke. Because even though like a lot of these numbers are talking about public infrastructure, um, they're, they're, the private infrastructure is also messed up. People's homes um, with their own internal plumbing, the the small appliances that use water, those are corroding, and this is a undue burden on, on residents. And Flint people need to be, um, should, should be at the front line for those jobs um, when, th when those come down. Then finally, the people who are directly impacted should be driving the work and should be um, at the center and, and crafting the tools for our own liberation because this paternalistic decision making is really within the embedded in the emergency manager law, which in itself that idea is embedded in racist tropes of, of, of our history. And you know, this election, like it's kind of like who are we as a country? Well, what's happening in Flint, Michigan right now is who we are as a country. So they need to America needs to embrace that as well, because we've been living uh, on bottled water for over two and a half years, and there hasn't been anything to change that. So we still have people who are using bottled water to shower, to bathe. And if we say that we're the greatest country on earth, and that's what people believe, then who the hell are we that we have this within our own borders and nobody's doing anything about it. And there is really, like really when you follow some of the federal, federal policy and the lack of urgency when it comes to responding to that, that in itself is like just embedded in, in racism and, um, and, and, and you know, the EPA with some of the, um, inf some of the information that was made public, they said, do we wanna go on a limb for Flint? And it feels like with the lack of urgency to getting resources into Flint and into um, and stuff, a lot of stuff that doesn't even cost any money, like creating a registry for everyone who's been impacted by the water crisis. Like, why do we have to fight for that? You think that that should be something that's um, that's like rooted in humanity? And we have a let like a, a federal Congress and a Michigan legislature that's not in, that's not in touch with their humanity at all. But we have people who elected them are, and they've been sending resources and prayers and everything else to the city of Flint. And unfortunately, that hasn't been trickled up to the people who they elected. Thank you, Nayera. Um, like uh, Mrs. Deloney and, and Ms. Sharif, 
uh, Kent Key is a resident of Flint. Um, Dr. Key has been involved in a number of uh, research projects um, and academic uh, exercises when he was employed by the University of Michigan at the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health uh, Research. Uh, he is now at the uh, Michigan State University uh, School of Human Medicine. He will uh, uh, present uh, uh, some points about a couple of policy topics and also include a discussion of creation of some new community-based processes that have come about, come about or were formed as a result of this uh, crisis. Dr. Key, take it away. Good evening or good afternoon. I'm not sure which one it is anymore. But it's a pleasure to be here and to really talk to you about what's happening in Flint and you're really hearing from actual people who live in Flint. Um, in the previous years, um, the community-based organization partners have had many discussions regarding how to vet researchers that are coming into Flint. And you all probably can imagine that Flint is like the smorgasbord for research now, because everybody from public health to medical research to policy, everyone wants to get a piece of Flint because people are on tenure tracks, people need publications, people need to really make the accomplishments that they need in order to obtain the goal that they have. So in previous years, um, community-based organization partners, um, we have been a part of research, specifically community-based participatory research for many years. And we had, and I'm thinking probably as early as 2010, we started having conversations about what does the community need in order to ensure that whatever research that is happening in it, it is actually equitable and looks at mutual benefit for the community. When we think of traditional IRBs, which we have to go through in institutions, you know, it's really looking at do no harm, make sure that there's no harm to the community. But the community-based organization partners, um, we created what is called a community ethics review board, a CERB. And what this CERB does it goes beyond what the IRB does. It does not so much look at the research design and those things that the IRB looks at, but it looks at what is the mutual benefit that will happen to the community that is being engaged in research. Traditional research is more like that helicopter commando style where the researcher comes in, swoops in, gets the information, and is off back to the ivory towers. And what is left for the, for the community? Does the community get to co-own the data? Does the community get to understand how to use the data in order to write the grants to do provide the programs that the data suggests that they need? What is the mutual benefit? So since that time in 2011, I actually um, went to our executive director at CBOP, Mrs. Deloney, and I asked her about putting a community ethics review board in place for CBOP. Um, we were at a community campus partnerships for health meeting, CCPH, and I saw that there was a, a group in Bronx, New York that had one, and Galveston, Texas that had one, and they were colleagues of ours. And so from that time, um, the community-based organization partners has this CERB, is what we call it, that is in place now that actually vets the research that is happening in the community. Looking at it from an equity perspective, making sure and ensuring that it will be mutually beneficial, not just for the researcher or that institution, but also for the residents and the community in Flint. That's one of the newer pieces that we put in place, and actually we were working on that prior to the Flint water crisis, or we really like to call it the Flint water crime um, happening. Um, since that time, also in January 2016, um, community residents, we have been really mobilizing in various town hall meetings and dialogues around two major concerns. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of concerns because there, there is a lot of mistrust in the community. But two of the greater concerns that really struck with me was the need to coordinate the monies that will come into the city as a result of the Flint water crisis. You had celebrities, you had people from all across the world that were donating monies to come in to help the city to cope with this. And what we did not want to happen is what happened in New Orleans with Katrina. I don't know how many of you, how many of you have been to New Orleans in the last couple of years? 
And when you go to those same neighborhoods that were most devastated, they still lay in devastation. And we wanted to ensure that there was not going to happen in Flint and that the people who were really doing the work and the communities that really needed the assistance would get the resources. And so that was one of the, the concerns the community had. And one of the second concern was the need to coordinate the research because as I just mentioned, there was gonna be an onset, just a flood of researchers contacting people in Flint, and it has happened. We've had pastors that have come to us because some researcher in Utah or Wyoming somewhere that has never been in Flint wants to do a study and will offer an incentive if they can recruit from their congregation. Now these pastors, many of them have no understanding of human subjects protections, have never engaged in research, so as far as the, the ethical responsibilities around it, they don't understand those concepts and those dynamics. And so with, un, and with that understanding, I had several conversations as a resident at that time, I was here at the Michigan Institute for Clinical Health Research, and I had many conversations with colleagues from U of M Flint. Dr. Seelig is here, she's the director of their public health department there. I had conversations with um, our health officer at the Genesee County Health Department, had conversations, and I was representing CBOP in many of these conversations, and we talked to some colleagues at MSU, and we got the idea together to form what is called the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. And what this center does specifically is it looks at creating an, a, a coordination or a, 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 a mechanism by which researchers who want to come into Flint post the Flint water crisis would have to go through this center, or we strongly suggest, because you can't make researchers do that, but we strongly suggest that they would go through this center. And this center was funded by um, the, the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, University of Michigan Flint, and Michigan State University. The presidents put money up to actually fund this center. And so what we were looking at here was to create a synergy around research and to foster ethical and respectable community academic partnerships. And this was novel in the sense that we had two rival schools coming together to do something that was led by the community. And what we did, um, I think that's one of the, the more ingenious things we did was we inserted the CERB as the vetting mechanism so that when researchers came through, the CERB had to review the research proposals, have those conversations with the researchers, and then they would either provide a letter of support or they would deny a letter of support for that project to go through. And this is a, a national model, really, of looking at a cross-university, cross campus research model to really create a mechanism to ensure that there is equity, that there is safety, and that no harm is done to community with mutual benefit. Also, during that same span of time, because you remember all of this kind of happened real quick at the end of January 2016, um, Dr. Cool is here as well. She had an idea from the University of Michigan Flint campus of putting together a water course. And what was needed was a platform to really engage communities so that they can really talk about what's happening, but also hear from partners, hear from experts, hear from other residents. And so with that, um, we created in 2016, that was the winter semester, and we created what we call a platform for bi-directional learning so that not only were the experts in engineering and the experts from the medical community and the experts from public health able to share with the community, but the experts from the north side and the experts from the south side and the east side of Flint were able to give their expertise to those other experts. So this class is continuing even now. Um, we are currently in the, the fall course session, and if you, have, if you want to see anything regarding the class, if you just go to U of M Flint's website, you can go to the, to the website and you can put in search there the Flint Water Course. And it's also all the videos, all the sessions have been archived there as well as on YouTube. So I just wanted to share that with you. That's another mechanism that we are getting a lot of the themes and hearing really what the community is saying as it relates to that. Then the following piece is the health and health equity in all policies. A lot of people have heard of health in all policies. Since this time, um, Kay Doerr, who is the chair of our Board of Health um, in Genesee County, myself, um, Mark Valachak, 
um, Dr. Seelig, um, CBOP, and others have been having discussions about really creating an opportunity so that Flint could adopt health and all policies. And the health and all policies is a policy that states that any, any law, any ordinance that is passed in a community has to be looked at from the perspective of how will it impact health. And so we're looking at if we had things like this in place, not only on the local level, but on the state level, then how would that have changed or altered the power that the emergency manager would have had? So since that time, um, we have actually in Flint got our health equity and all policies passed at our um, board of health level. And just recently it was passed. We're the first in the state to have it passed at the county commissioner's level. So with that, those are some of the policy pieces and some of the new initiatives that are happening in Flint since the water crisis. Thank you, Dr. Key. We're gonna go right to uh, questions at this point. You may have a number of questions um, and or comments. And uh, Imad Moran. go right ahead. Uh, my name is Imad Moran. I'm a first year BA student here at the Ford School. Uh, uh, my connection with uh, the Flint water crisis is that I worked, uh, I assisted, I interned for the Flint water interagency coordinating committee on behalf of the, uh, the governor's office of urban and metropolitan initiatives. Uh, and the first question from the audience is, and this is to any member of the panel, is in your opinion, holding all else equal, could the poisoning of Flint been reduced and or prevented if there was no emergency manager and local government instead was in power? Well, um, in March of 2015, our Flint City Council passed a resolution to move back to Detroit and the emergency manager at that point in time, it was Jerry, Gerald Ambrose. He sent a letter to um, the deputy treasurer and said that, like, we, you don't have the money. So um, money was the sole motivator and uh, people's health was not, in, in, was, not, um, was not used in how they made decisions. And just to add on to that, absolutely. As a resident and a young boy growing up in Flint, I, my uncles and grandfathers, they took us to the Flint River to practice fishing. We knew that we could not eat anything that came out of the Flint River, but we practiced here and then we went up north to, do, to fish for real. But even, so I say that to say this, as, as a child, you knew that that water was not right. So absolutely the residents would not have, would not have supported that. I mean, I think we talked about this uh, a little bit in that without that public discussion within local decision making, maybe someone would have come up and said, brought up the, the condition of the river, the perceived condition of the river. Or someone would have asked, well, you know, that river, you know, has this reputation. What is the treatment process you're going through? And they might have laid it out. And then someone listening to me said, well, what are you going to do about corrosion control? We, I mean, we don't know because there was no opportunity for any public input, either by the mayor or the city council or by the general public, in this decision making. The emergency manager is in absolute control of all decision making, all information, and there's no ability to challenge it unless you are probably uh, in the treasurer's office or, or the governor's office. There's really no way. So without that discussion, any of these questions could have come up. And it could have been just, uh, you know, having been on local government, a constituent emailing you, calling you, stopping you on the street and say, hey, this, is, this decision's coming up. Have you thought of X, Y, and Z? And then you get to go ask, and maybe we would have prevented it. Even in 1970, the government, and especially Flint, had PPB, BVP in the water. And they told us, do not drink that water. At the same time, they were talking about the, the dumping of General Motors in there. And that's, they've been doing the water from Detroit for 50 years, so they knew how bad the water was. And then to come back because they had no affinity with the, with the city of Flint. And that is why it's absolutely, like you said, it would not have happened because we all knew not to use that water. Hello, my name is Ivy Tran. I'm a second year master's student in public policy and applied economics. Um, I'm also a part of the charity auction and it's my pleasure to announce that this year um, the Ford School nominated the Community Foundation of Greater Fint as the recipient of the charity auction. And I'd like to thank our panelists and moderator for being here today to discuss this topic. The next question to all of the panel members is, because this crisis is rooted in racism, where can students of policy begin to help address the situation? What was the last part of the question? Oh, 
Can you, you state it one more time? Yeah. Because this crisis is rooted in racism, where can students of policy begin to help address the situation in Flint? Well, one of the things we have been looking at is dealing with the internalized effects of uh, racism. Because we can teach people behavior, but we need to teach them to think and to feel connected. Uh, all our education in, in American schools as it relates to African Americans would put us down, make us think we're less than because our constitutional. So we created what we call a freedom school. And we try to get the youngest kids we can because their parents have to bring them. And we talk about this thing. We talk about the bi-direction of racism. For example, for European Americans, it's internalized superiority and white privilege. For African Americans, it's internalized inferiority and self-hatred. So we talk about that. We give them affirmation. We teach them meditation and silence. But you, and you have to do it in small groups. Like masses, you're not going to change much. So we say groups of 13, and we try to meet with them. We have uh, affirmations. and The main one is, I know me. So they learn their all history because most people think African American history began in America. We're the sons of the Africans that you brought here. We teach them to accept themselves. Like, because of the pain we have experienced from racism, two thirds of African Americans want to be accepted by European Americans. We want to say, no, you got to accept yourself first. We talk about loving yourself, and we make mistakes forgiving yourself, and that a higher power lives, and we practice it. Little kids can say it, they can wrote it up, two years old. Then we start teaching them what to go with it. But you have to make a commitment to want to change. For example, when we started w working on racial disparities, and they asked me to join the committee, I refused. I mean, they kept at me, so I, I did join. And the person who helped the most was me. But a lot of European Americans, I mean, we are friends today, and I would never have thought that. So we got to take it on, deal with ourselves first. Each one you need to make a commitment and then you can spread it out to other people. And I would also say, because you asked also as it relates from a perspective of the student body in this school, one thing is to really start some dialogue, start some conversations, because the racial climate in this country is, 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 is something I have never seen in my lifetime before. And when you look at the, 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 the brutality with the police and, and so many other things that are happening, I, I thought I never would ever think this, and when I thought it the first time, I thought I was crazy. But I was like, the only benefit for me, and I'm not trying to offend anyone from the Trump campaign, is that it really showed where people really stand and where, what people really feel. And I think that since everything is out on the open and on the table, let's have a dialogue about it. Let's talk about it. Let's, have, let's listen to various perspectives. And then let's go back to history and look at the facts. Because I'm not necessarily trying to move you, and I, you're not necessarily going to move me, but we can agree to disagree, and we can also have a healthy dialogue and a discourse of understanding how one event may affect me differently than it may affect you. And so I think starting conversations, really being able to be comfortable talking about race. I think younger, our, the younger generations that are here now and that will come behind us may be a little bit more comfortable talking about race as long as, the, as long as they have the parents that are teaching them to be comfortable. But it's really hard for a lot of, a lot of um, citizens of this country to really talk about it because to do that you have to look at a history that many people are not proud of. And I think also, um, not so I'm retreading what the other panelists have said, um, you know, be proud of your own experience. One of the things that happened in the context of the water crisis is people were sharing their own experience and they were being dismissed. Like one of the experiences was people showing like their discolored water in public settings and the response was, you've dyed that water. Or when it was tested and it came up with lead, the response was, well, you must have put some pencils in that water. And I'm like, well, there hasn't been like lead pencils like my whole life, so I don't know what that is. But, um, but really, really, um, you know, honoring, and I've, I've done like um, facilitation, like one, just don't be racist, but then two, like when you mess up, like be ready to receive that critique and criticism because this is a teachable moment. Um, and then also, Respecting other people's experience because when, when you're having these conversations, you're gonna be vulnerable because, I mean, like, I've, I've shared experiences and knew that that mess was racist. 
And when you have people like criticizing like your own experience, like you don't know your own experience, one that's like couched in white supremacy that you can that you know my experience better than I know my experience and I lived it. So that's like all messed up in of itself. But but being able and respecting each other equally so you can share each other's experience and it's received as that's your experience and not as a critique or you want to fix it or, or, or do other mess with it. Thank you for that. Our next question from the audience is, says, it seems like the, the Flint residents needed recognized experts, namely Dr. Mark Edwards, Dr. Mona and Atisha, to bring what the citizens already knew to public attention. How can policymakers and researchers do a better job of recognizing and validating citizen knowledge and expertise? That, that's a, a good question. And that's one that we struggle with in Flint right now on how to provide that. And I say that because so often, and, and again, I don't want to go back to specifically to the race issue, but oftentimes when groups that are minority are really raising their voice around something, it normally takes someone that's from the majority race to say it before it's heard or validated. And we see that quite often. What, what happened in Flint was the systemic disregard for community voices. And when I'm talking about community, I'm not talking about the more broadly defined community definition that most of the government is using now. I'm talking about the underprivileged, the under-resourced, the under, um, what's so many of the unders, marginalized communities. Um, and Flint, by the book, did everything right as far as mobilizing, lifting voice, doing protests, um, trying to have media um, coverage. Of course, the media at the time had even apologized at one of the water courses that it just wasn't the hot topic of the day. So there are some policies we need to even address as it relates to media because a lot of times they are the voice of what is happening in a community when you don't necessarily live in that community and sometimes even when you live in that community. And so how and how do we do that? That's something, that's another conversation we need to have, but it is something that is systemic in this country when we have these communities that are poor or marginalized or of color that are raising their voices around something, then it takes someone who's not necessarily from that community. I'll never forget, I was on a conference call. I'm gonna just use this example, then I'm done. I was on a conference call and I was the only minority PhD on this conference call. And um, everyone just about was European American. I think there was one that was from the Middle East. And they asked a question, a suggestion. And I gave my suggestion and the person that was moderating it was like, oh, Kent, that's thoughtful. We'll consider that. Then about four minutes later, a European-American colleague said the exact same thing I said. But then it was ingenious when she said it. And so my response was, well, was it not ingenious five minutes ago when I said it? And the moderator said, I didn't realize that's what you said. And everybody else on the call said, yeah, he did. That happens to me all the time, quite often. And so if we're going to do what you just asked, then we need to really have some in-depth conversations about the types of things that happen in this country that really marginalizes the voices of others, but then give platform to those who may look totally different from them. Well, I will say that is still ongoing because um, last week, the Joint Select Committee on the Flint Water Public Health Emergency, which was released by the bicameral, bipartisan legislature, um, their, their um, key response events timeline began in September 2nd, 2015 with Mark Edwards. So it really erased, um, really erased um, all, everything that the grassroots has done like up to that point. So um, it just brings to mind, I, I really love the Hamilton, the play, and the last song on the soundtrack is Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. And as you have this, even this narrative, and it's still ongoing, it's extremely dynamic. It's being e -frame, reframed, and the grassroots and that stuff is being erased from the public narrative. And it's just being like, just like Leanne Walters, even though she was part of a whole group, 
and like Dr. Mark Edwards and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, sometimes Miguel Del Toro, but most of the times not. Um, but when you think of like what's happening right now in Standing Rock, like they've been occupying space since April and it's just now like this month starting to get some mainstream attention, mostly not. But I mean, there, there is a, I will say this is a systemic thing of, of really like trying to reframe narratives to eliminate like the resistance and the people in those narratives. And that could be because they don't really want widespread revolution. I don't know. But um, when, you, when you're able to just like pluck like a token, like it's just like one person, when people are facing the similar issues as you, like if, if they don't believe that it's a group of people and yes, you, you do have the power to like shift narratives and, and reframe policy, if it's just like one person, you can really individualize that and really take the collective out of organizing. And that's something that we have to really stop right now because it's happening right now. Um, this will be the last question that we have time for. The question is, it would take the government billions of dollars to fix or replace all plumbing in Flint. Unfortunately, this seems infeasible. What is the best thing the state and federal government can do to repair the crumbling infrastructure that is harming residents? I don't know you guys go it's too fast. Place all the pipes. Well, um, I think that also, we need to talk about a lot of the federal policies, too, because we have um, all of our policies at the federal level and the state level is in alignment with sprawl and consumption and not necessarily re reinvestment. So even at the federal level, we need to reframe that. But I go back to what I earlier said. Who are we as a country? Like, government messed this up. So government should be responsible for fixing it, and unfortunately, the ideology of um, people in power right now is they're trying to shift responsibility from government to um, nonprofits, even residents, because right now we're responsible, as residents, we're responsible for getting our own bottled water, like they do not deliver bottled water, and we have, and we're responsible for processing our own water, we're using water filters, and those are fraught with human error. So when, you, when you're shifting like responsibility to nonprofits and clergy and just all of that stuff, you're really like they're really trying to abscond themselves of responsibility to actually like dive in and replace the pipes. And what they can do and could have done because the mayor, the governor had a rainy day fund with enough money to replace all those pipes. The first thing they need to do is would be to replace those pipes and test the waters around the soil around and see what's still there that needs to be worked on. Because they still discovered new bacteria as early as, as, as late as last week. And then the disease is coming out. So that's the first thing they should do. And if it was a sense of urgency, I believe it was in Royal Oak someplace like that, it would have been done. So they keep telling us what they don't have. Don't tell them what you don't have. And the governor knows how we feel because we actually told him with shaking his hand, looking his eye, I told him. And right now, so, I'm sorry. And right now, we have the Army Corps uh, engineers standing on standby, standing rock, waiting, waiting to build uh, pipes through sacred land, sacred indigenous land. And we don't have the Army Corps engineers in Flint digging up pipes when they know that, and it's on record that a community has been poisoned. The, uh, you know, Flint is a situation where I agree that it's the state's responsibility. The state caused this. It, it, it ruined not only uh, it, it not only the health impacts, but the infrastructure damage because of the grossness, the crossivity, the crossivity of the water itself that they allowed to has taken years off the the life of the distribution system. Uh, they're having ten to twelve. They were having ten to twelve main, water main breaks a day, four to five hundred a year. Totally abnormal. Uh, so Flint. We as a state own that, and we have to agree to pay for what's needed there. The statewide basis on drinking water, we're underfunding our investment in our drinking water structure somewhere between a quarter to a half a billion dollars a year in Michigan alone. This is a national, the infrastructure question is a national question. 
and there are multiple ways of looking at it, but the cost of not doing something and putting it off is greater than doing it today. If we can put 80 to $90 billion into a war in Iraq, how can we not do that? And it's on a monthly basis. How can we not do that in our drinking water infrastructure? And we need to come up with a system that guarantees clean, safe, affordable drinking water. Who would ever have thought that the water coming out of your tap wasn't safe to drink? And that it would poison you, kill you. 12 people have died from Legionnaire's disease. Whether or not it was related is unknown, but the human cost is much greater than if we just would address the situation to begin with. So it's a national question. This is stuff that the president's looking at. This is what the industry itself is looking at. But we have to start to demand that we provide the basic services that are there. And this industry deals in uh, consent orders and judgments that are in the billions of dollars. We can deal with it. We just have to say, let's do it and figure out the most equitable way of doing it. But the bottom line is not clean, safe drinking water a human right. Access to that should be should a human be. right. So I mean, that, that is how you frame it for me, mm -hmm. is that if it is a human right, then we need to, as a society, be able to provide that to everyone in this country. With that, I want to add one uh, additional point that uh, Dr. Suzanne Seelig is here and has information about uh, the Healthy Flint uh, Research Coordinating Center uh, because some of the questions were, were bent towards what is it that students could do or get involved in. Um, and so she is here with uh, that information. So at this point, I want to thank um, your attempt for, thank you for your attention, your thoughtfulness, your thoughtful questions. I want to thank uh, the panel. Um, thank you for your forthrightness and for sharing uh, your expertise uh, with the Ford School uh, audience. So with that, there is a, a reception. The panel members will be available for additional questions. And with that, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you.